it's a pleasure to welcome Surya Ganguly. Um, welcome him back to the Graduate Center. We've, we've done this before at, at the Symposia, symposia Past. Um, Surya is a theoretical physicist who's, who moved uh, in his postdoctoral years to thinking about problems uh, in neuroscience and eventually in machine learning and has made, worked on a wide variety of issues at this, at this uh, Sort of threefold boundary, um, and uh, always brings um, a lot of mathematical elegance and, and taste to the problems that he chooses. Uh, lately, he's been thinking a lot about uh, deep networks, uh, in particular, some of the kinds that are relevant for models of language. Um, and so we thought it would be good to uh, exploit him as the, as the, the bridge between um, the more phenomenological thinking about language that we started the morning with, and the more specific language models that we'll hear later in the afternoon. So without any further ado, let me give you Surya. I think he has the same plan um, to make pauses, uh, and I'll also keep an eye on the chat in case people have questions. So um, Surya, thank you. Uh, thanks, Bill. It's great to, to be back at CUNY <laughs> again. So yeah, so we've been working sort of the nexus of sort of neuroscience, uh, machine learning and physics. We're, we're mostly interested in sort of understanding how neural circuits work. And I think there's an intersecting set of questions in terms of how neural circuits work, both in biological and artificial settings. And so we've been working in both those settings and, and we've built up sort of a body of work. Uh, I know this is a physics center. So um, we built up a body of work where we've been using ideas from physics to anal and, and mathematics to analyze neural circuits, both biological and artificial. And it's actually surprising, there's a rich set of tools that you can use across mathematics and physics to gain some insight into these systems. And if you're interested in, in sort of an overview uh, of this area, we just wrote a review article for annual reviews of condensed matter physics on the statistical mechanics of deep learning, uh, where we looked at a variety of topics. What can neural networks say? What does their loss landscape look like? How do signals propagate through them? How do they generalize? How can they imagine through generative models? And, and, and we wrote this really for physicists, um, uh, but, it, but it should be accessible uh, uh, to, to general, general uh, uh, practitioners and theorists. Um, but in any case, I, I, I was gonna talk about a subset of this work, uh, not so much on language actually, but a related topic, semantic cognition uh, in infants and machines. So I'll spend the bulk of my time on this stuff. And then, um, you know, generalization is a key issue, right? Uh, uh, both for, for humans and for, for machines. Uh, how do neural networks generalize from limited experience? And so I'll talk a, a, about a theory of that. And then if there's time, we'll go into this, this uh, I, again, this is a physics uh, institute. So I, I thought I would talk also about uh, some theory that we've done on how do you speed up learning uh, in, in nonlinear neural networks through a uh, a topic that I think is near and dear to Bill's heart, the notion of dynamic criticality. Um, okay, but uh, by the way, again, um, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I can't see your chat window and, and Bill, I guess you're monitoring the chat. So just feel free to interrupt. I don't mind that at all. In fact, I welcome it. Um, okay, but before I get started, actually I made this slide during uh, Jenny's talk, uh, her fantastic talk. Um, we haven't really worked that much on language per se, but we, we have published our first paper on language in collaboration with some really get great uh, computational uh, uh, linguists and NLP folk uh, led by John Hewitt, a really fantastic grad student. And here we were asking the expressivity problem, right? Is to, to what extent can neural networks uh, uh, express language, right? Now, we were interested in sort of looking at simple mathematical formulations of language and asking, you know, what types of neural networks can generate languages uh, or generate sentences from such a language. So we looked at a very simple but well-known mathematical model called the, the Dick KM languages. This is a language of well-formed nested parentheses of K types of maximal nesting depth M, right? So, so here's an example where you have two types of parentheses, one and two, and they open and close and they have to be well-formed. So they're all paired up adequately. So this is a toy model of language that captures a very important a facet of language, which is, which is long range nested dependencies that are characteristic of natural syntax. Uh, and and so, we, so we asked, well, well, can neural networks even learn? If, if you were given examples of Dick K, could they learn uh, um, to generate other examples of Dick K, like generalize and learn the grammar of this language? 
So we, we actually looked at the expressivity problem, not the learnability problem, but we showed that uh, uh, neural networks, you know, the LSTMs that are often used in, in, in NLP can actually generate uh, DIC KM languages using finite precision weights and activities. Uh, and, and they require um, order M log K hidden units. So the, the depth, uh, it's linear in the nesting depth and logarithmic in the number of uh, or vocabulary size, so to speak. Moreover, we showed that this was actually optimal. We showed that no neural network can do this with fewer units. Uh, and previous constructions required exponential in M units, um, hidden units, exponential in the depth. Um, and the key idea is that, that you can write down the weights of an LSTM so that they can efficiently implement a bounded depth stack, right? So if there was no limit on the depth of nesting, this would be an example of a context-free grammar. And from Chomsky's hierarchy of language, we know that the machines required to recognize and generate languages corresponding to context-free uh, uh, grammars are so-called pushdown automata. Th these are automata that have a stack where you know each time an open parentheses occurs, you push it onto the stack. And when the corresponding close parentheses occurs, you push it off the stack, so to speak. Uh, we showed the, the key idea behind their construction is we showed that LSTM networks can uh, efficiently implement bounded depth stacks, right? So, so eventually kind of the program here is to really try to create a dictionary between neural processing and formal syntax and semantics in, in linguistics. Uh, and this is sort of a, a very, like, very like baby steps into the genesis of such a dictionary. Um, but anyways, I just thought I'd advertise this here. I wasn't really planning on talking to, about this, but I was very inspired by Jenny's talk. Uh, and I, I just thought I'd mention this work. So you, you can find the paper. Uh, it was just published in, a, in, an L, in an NLP conference uh, this year. Okay, so let's go to the, the main topic, um, a mathematical theory of semantic development. So this is joint work with uh, Andrew Sachs and Jay McClelland. It could easily be called the misadventures of an applied physicist wandering around the psychology department. So. Uh, you know, when I arrived at Stanford, I just started talking to Jay and I learned about all the amazing work that Jay had done uh, over the years in modeling uh, infant semantic development. And I, it was just my attempt to understand this work uh, better. Okay. So um, let's see. So it, the, the references, yeah, yeah, the relevant references are these two works. And there's a, sorry, there's a work in PNAS also that just appeared that's the main uh, uh, paper. So, okay, so what is uh, semantic cognition? Okay, so human semantic cognition refers to our ability to learn, recognize, comprehend, and produce inferences about properties and objects and events in the world, especially properties that are not present in our current perceptual stimulus, right? So, for example, uh, does a cat have fur? Do birds fly, right? We, we can all answer these semantic questions, uh, despite the fact that there is probably no cat or bird in most of the rooms that we're sitting in, right? So our, our ability to do this likely relies on our ability to form internal representations of categories in the world, right? We never see the same bird twice or rarely see the same bird twice. And so we form a notion of a category of a bird and we associate all these facts with that category. And we use these categorical representations to recall these facts, presumably. Right? So, um, so what are the types of psychophysical tasks that have been used to probe semantic cognition? So I can't possibly, this is a huge field, I can't, possibly go into all of the experiments that have been done in this field, but I can give you a flavor, right? One is uh, looking time studies. One is um, uh, at, what, at what age can an infant distinguish between two different categories of objects, right? Um, so for example, you can show an infant pictures of say uh, cows, a sequence of pictures of cows. The first time it sees a cow, it look, its looking time will go up and then it drops over time. Then you suddenly switch to a horse and if the infant's old enough to distinguish between horses and cows, its looking time will go up on the first horse. If it's not, it won't, right? And so you can do pairwise categorical distinctions at all levels of sort of the hierarchical tree of life or, 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 or different hierarchical trees over objects. Yeah, so, so basically what you find is that um, infants can distinguish uh, high level categorical distinctions, say animals versus plants at an earlier age than they can distinguish uh, fine level uh, categorical distinctions, even when you control for perceptual similarity. We'll, we'll get more into that later. Okay, property verification tasks. You can ask uh, uh, kids, older kids now, uh, can a canary move? Can it sing? And the response latency uh, uh, 
can be used to, to deduce the existence of central versus peripheral properties, right? So for example, can a canary sing is answered more quickly than can a canary move? Okay, category membership is a sparrow a bird, is an ostrich a bird, right? So typical, uh, typical members of a category, you answer these questions earlier. Atypical members, it takes you longer to answer these questions. For example, it'll take you longer to answer is an ostrich a bird. Um, so there's various studies been uh, done on these uh, things in both natural and artificial domains and artificial domains you also control for frequency effects and so forth. So there's a huge body of work here. Inductive generalization is another interesting one. Uh, for example, you can tell somebody a, uh, a familiar property about a novel object, i.e. does a blick have feathers? And then you can ask, does it fly? Does it sing? And you can ask, how willing are you to, to um, deduce uh, familiar properties of a novel object given only one property about that object. Similarly, generalizing novel properties to familiar objects. So for example, a bird has gene X, right? So you know about birds, but you don't know what gene X is. Then you ask, does a crocodile have gene X? Does a dog have gene X? And infants show, uh, infants and children show um, developmental patterns of generalization that change over time. They tend to overgeneralize early on and then uh, make their generalizations more specific later on. Uh, so, so this was my son when he was uh, a few months old, and, and, and so I watched him go through all this stuff, which is very, very interesting. I uh, even did some experiments on him, uh, probably pretty uncontrolled, though. Um, so, so Jay, has, Jay McClellan has, has had a body of work that uh, there's a beautiful book, I highly recommend it, uh, called, oops, sorry, called Semantic Cognition, uh, uh, that, that basically summarizes all of these experiments and also models all of these experiments using neural networks, right? So I'm gonna focus on, in this talk, focus on two aspects of the modeling, the progressive differentiation of concepts, which is that, again, children acquire broader semantic distinctions earlier than more fine-grained distinctions. Um, and then category coherence, there's some groupings of objects, i.e. the set of all things that are dogs, that are very useful groupings. We even have a name for them. But there's other groupings, like the set of all things that are blue, that are not that useful for us. Uh, we don't have a name for them. So, so how do we decide what's worth a name, what, what, what's worth a, a group? Like what makes a group of objects a coherent group versus an incoherent group? How, and, and can we prove, for example, that neural networks only learn the coherent groupings in a universe of all possible groupings? Okay. So those are the two things that I'm going to focus on. We looked at all the, uh, a bunch of these other things as well. Um, so how did Jay even model this? These are very, very complicated things to model, right? So what he did was he, he looked at toy models where he had a universe of objects and properties. And, and you could ask various questions about these objects. So for example, can a canary uh, grow, move, fly, or sing? And, and yes, it can do all of those things, but it, it, it can't do the others. Uh, sorry, fly or sing, yeah. So, so he just trained a neural network uh, to answer questions about objects. Right? And he looked at the evolution of internal representations of objects in this space uh, over the training time of this network. And it was just trained using backpropagation. Okay, so, and this is, a, this is a visualization of the evolution of those internal representations. So this is a multidimensional scaling plot of the developmental evolution of internal representations in this neural network uh, as a function of training time. And, and these are the internal representations of the various objects. You can see that early on in development, the animals separate uh, first from the plants. And then later on, the fish separate from the birds and the trees separate from the uh, flowers. And then finally, individual fish separate at the very end. Okay. This is the same story using a hierarchical clustering plot of the internal representations uh, here. Okay, so this is a very robust phenomenon. It happens all the time. And the first time that I saw this, I was at once uh, amazed, but also disturbed, right? I was amazed that these neural networks sort of behaved a lot like infants in this respect. Um, I was disturbed because I, you know, this is a very striking phenomenon, but I didn't understand mathematically why this was happening or, or what the principles were that led this to happen. Um, by the way, there, people have been measuring these, uh, the, the distance matrices between internal representations of objects, um, both in, in monkeys and humans, and they see a remarkable match. So this is the, so here you have a matrix of individual objects um, 
So you can, in, in human infertile ball cortex, you can measure fMRI activity patterns and you can measure the similarity between the pattern in response to one object and another object. And this is a similarity matrix. This is the same experiment done in, in uh, monkey and they're quite similar to each other. Uh, we'll have some theorems uh, in, in a simple setting that show that they have to be similar under certain conditions. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later on. Okay, this is the same experiment shown through a hierarchical dendrogram. So these similarity, uh, the similarity structure of neural representations is something that appears to be conserved across species. Okay. All right, th there was other very interesting learning dynamics in this network. There are these waves of learning. So if you can ask, you, you, when you ask, can a canary move and you ask how well does the neural network answer this question, you have these waves of learning. Okay, that mirror the waves of progressive differentiation. Okay, so basically the theoretical questions we then set out to ask were the following. What are the mathematical principles underlying the hierarchical self-organization of internal representations of the network? You know, what's playing a role here? The nonlinear input output response, the learning rule, the input statistics, which Jenny so nicely emphasized uh, in a sequential domain. Um, and also what is a mathematical definition of category coherence and how does it relate to the speed of category learning? In essence, what categories are learned in the first place? This relates to a question that was asked in the previous talk. How do infants know what to learn in the first place and what to give up on? Uh, it, it turns out neural networks have inductive biases in their learning dynamics that, that pick up on what we would think of as coherent categories. And I'll explain that soon. Uh, why are some properties learned more quickly than others? And how can we explain inductive uh, changing patterns of inductive generalization over developmental time scales? Is there okay. any, could I, could I? Yeah. Um, interject a question yeah. here. Um, in the examples that you showed us so far, notions of similarity are seem reasonably metric. Um, I mean, in oh. some cases explicitly so, because you've put points down on a plane. Yes. Um, it's not obvious that, that the raw perceptual, you know, if I, if I stay in the domain of, of asking people questions, yeah. um, and I or even measuring their reaction times and things like that, that notions of similarity will in fact be metric. Oh, and I totally agree. In fact, there's data suggesting that it's actually not. Uh, if, you, um, if you just ask humans, if you ask for similarity ratings from humans just behaviorally, and you construct similarity metrics that way, then it turns out these, these similarity metrics uh, sometimes violate some notions of metric distance. I, I believe like the triangle inequality even. And so um, the, at least human elicited similarity judgments violate notions of metric spaces. And I don't actually have a good explanation for that. I, I'm not aware of any good explanation for that in general. Um, what we're looking at is the similarity, uh, neural similarity matrices, right? And those by definition, if you define the neural, act, the neural representation of object as a trial average firing activity vector of um, neural activity patterns in response to that object, then it necessarily obeys a metric uh, uh, relationship because you've imposed upon it. You've imposed that upon it. This dichotomy between neural similarity obeying the, the theorems of a metric, but uh, uh, psychophysical similarity not, I, I don't know how to bridge that dichotomy. That's an excellent question. Um, right. Yeah, that'd be fun to discuss. Uh, if people have thoughts on that, I'd love to discuss that. Uh, but here we're just looking at neural similarity, which is, met which is metric based both in experiments and in theory. Um, okay, so okay, so how can we develop a theory of this? So we're we're dealing with complicated nonlinear networks. So I, 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 we just decided to ask, you know, what would a linear network do? Now this might feel like you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because, from the perspective of modeling the expressivity of nonlinear neural networks, linear networks are a terrible model because the composition of of linear functions is linear, right? So you can only com compute linear function this way. But the learning dynamics of these linear networks are highly nonlinear. It can, it can actually capture many aspects of the nonlinear learning dynamics of nonlinear networks. So from that perspective, they're an interesting toy model as, I'll, as I hope to demonstrate. So, so we just asked, you, you, have a, you have a two hidden layer neural, a two weight layer neural network with one hidden neural layer. Why is the learning dynamics nonlinear? If you think about this neural network as trying to mimic a desired output for a given input, the, the measure of error could be the output of the network minus the desired output squared, right? So in terms of uh, the degree of dependence on the weights, it's uh, 
the error is uh, quadra is um, quadratic, sorry, quartic in the weights because you have the composition of weights, so you get a square, and then you have the square at the output in the error, so you get four powers in the weights. So if you do gradient descent, the right-hand side of the gradient descent equations will be cubic in the weights. Right? So um, it turns out that these, uh, so, so, so basically the gradient, is, it's, the learning dynamics is gradient descent on a non-convex function and it's nonlinear, right? And these networks, the, the learning dynamics in these uh, networks exhibit these plateaus and then sudden drops in error and so forth. Um, and I'll, I'll skip this part of it actually. Okay, so we can write down the gradient descent dynamics and we can operate um, uh, in a batch setting where we average the gradient over many, many examples. And we take, that's equivalent to a slow learning rate uh, setting. And so we can write down a set of differential equations on the weight space. As promised, the right-hand side of the gradient descent equations are cubic in the weights. Now the place where the linearity really helps is because the, um, input output map is linear, it's sensitive to the data only through the second order statistics of the data, right? In particular, the input input correlation matrix, how correlated is one input neuron with another input neuron across the data set? And the input output correlation matrix, how correlated is an input neuron with an output neuron, again, averaged across the data set? Okay, so these correlation matrices are fundamentally what drive learning, but they drive learning on the weights in a nonlinear way. Okay. Um, we're going to simplify our lives by assuming that the data is whitened for us. It turns out in, in, in uh, Jay's simulations, it was whitened. The input data is whitened. But then, then all that matters is the input-output correlations. So despite the fact that these equations are nonlinear, we can actually find a class of exact solutions for these equations. And they do something actually quite sensible in hindsight. What they do is they build up the singular value decomposition of the input output correlation matrix over time. So let me review that. So, so, so let's say you have the input output correlation matrix. This tells you, so in a very toy example, if you have sort of a, a bunch of animals and a bunch of properties, right? The input output correlation matrix tells you sort of how likely a particular animal is to have a particular property. You can decompose this through the singular value decomposition into uh, a set of feature synthesizers. We, we can call these feature synthesizers. Each feature synthesizer is a mode that describes a pattern of activity across features. And you have the object analyzers. Each object analyzer is a mode that determines a pattern of activity across objects. And you have the singular values here. Okay, so this is sort of a semantic interpretation of, of the usual SVD. Okay, so this is, the, this is the SVD of an actual data set consisting of these animals and these properties and so forth. Um, I'll go more into it uh, later. But, but now, how do, the, how do you express the nonlinear solutions to the learning um, using this? Okay, so basically, there's a class of solutions where the product of the input output weights builds up the singular value decomposition of the input output correlation matrix mode by mode, where the stronger modes with larger singular value are learned earlier. Okay. So, so basically, uh, there's a time-dependent singular value that governs the time dependence of this of this matrix, and this time-dependent singular value can be can be you can we can come up with an analytic formula for it. It looks like a sigmoidal learning curve. That's if you start from small random weights, it starts small and then it rises to some final value. That final value is the actual singular value of your training data, and that it has a very sharp transition at a time that's given by one over the singular value. So just to state this slightly poetically, what this is in a way that will probably generalize to nonlinear networks is these networks learn stronger statistical structure earlier. Okay. The difficulty of generalizing that statement precisely to nonlinear networks is we don't know how to quantify the statistical structure that is learned, quantify its strength and compute when it's learned. But in this deep linear setting, we can do all of that. The strength of the statistical structure are singular modes, their strength is a singular value, and the time at which you learn is one over the singular value. Um, if, you actually visual, if you actually look at the energy landscape, these waves of learning have to do with saddle points in the error, error landscape of these neural networks, where while nothing is happening, you're getting sucked into the a saddle point along the stable manifold. And as the learning happens, you're repelled from the saddle point along the unstable manifold. 
and you get to lower error. So each time you get this wave of learning, you come close to a saddle point and you escape it. Um, I just wanted to just put that geometric picture into your head. I, I don't expect that to be, uh, I don't expect you to be convinced by it, but it is nevertheless true. And, and you can um, sort of see how it works in our paper. But, but that's the geometry underlying these waves of learning. Um, okay, so again, just to summarize, summarize again, statistical stru stronger statistical structure is learned faster. The strength of structure, um, sorry, sorry, the, yeah, stronger statistical structure is learned faster and the learning time is given by one over the singular value. Okay, so now the next question is, what does this all have to do with the hierarchical differentiation of concepts, which motivated all of this? So we now have a generic understanding of how deep linear networks work. By the way, all of this can be generalized to more hidden layers, but we don't need that uh, for this talk. Um, so, so what does this have to do with hierarchical differentiation of concepts? Okay, so the, the analysis that Jay and colleagues did were they looked at the learning dynamics empirically of neural networks for specific data sets, right? But the question is, can we move from specific data sets to general principles governing when a neural net, what a neural network learns when it's exposed to hierarchical structure? So we consider a neural network that's generated by a hierarchical generative model, okay? The hierarchical generative model mimics the process of evolution to generate hierarchical structure, right? And it creates a data set. That data set is then fed to the neural network. And we'd like to understand how the statistical structure in the generative model gets embedded in the weights of the neural network. Right? So the generative model um, is just a branching diffusion process on this sort of evolutionary tree. Roughly, you can think, think of this as an as ancestral organism. It speciates into two different you know, organisms, which then further speciates into other, two other organisms. And there are feature, and at the end of this, and the, the, the leaves of the tree, you generate a bunch of feature vectors. These feature vectors could be, for example, the presence or absence of wings or so forth. And you could have some ancestral state, which could be no wings. It has a small probability of uh, changing to, to elicit the appearance of wings. And then it has a small probability of, 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 of changing again, you know, for example, if you lose the wings. And then you generate a whole bunch of features this way independently. So it's just a branching diffusion process in a tree that generates independent features. It's a toy model of the evolutionary process that generates a hierarchical structure of features in the toy data sets that Jay, Jay and colleagues were using. So, so then at the end of the day, we get a bunch of feature vectors at the end of the leaves of this tree. And we know that it's the it's the correlational structure of these feature vectors, in particular, the singular value uh, decomposition of, of this set of feature vectors that drives learning in the system. So we can ask just what, what is the singular what are, is the singular vector structure of data generated from this hierarchical model? So we can, we can compute that analytically as well. And the basic idea is you get singular modes that reflect the hierarchical structure of the data generation process. Uh, the, the top singular mode is a uniform mode. It's not informative. So th these are the object, analyzes, object analyzer vectors that are functions on the leaves of the tree or functions on the objects, right? Um, the, second mode, the, the second strongest singular mode is, is a singular vector that's positive on the left branch and negative on the right branch. So it can distinguish the broadest level categorical distinction, the ancestral event that occurred here, right? The next collection of singular vectors that have the next largest singular value discriminate between these pair, this pair of objects and this pair of objects, and the other one discriminates between this pair of objects and this pair of objects. So they make distinctions at the next leaf of the tree, at the next level of the tree. And then finally, you have the lowest modes that make distinctions between individual items. Right? Uh, this is the similarity structure. It has a blocks within block structure. Um, for those of you who are kind of aficionados of spin glass theory and Parisi, Parisi matrices, it's basically identical to that. Um, you, we can compute the singular values and compare with experiments, they, they match up. But now I hope you can we can sort of put it all together and understand what's going on, right? So you, we put together a, a few facts, right? Um, that that is, enable us to conclude that any network must exhibit progressive differentiation of concepts on any data set generated by this class of hierarchical diffusion processes. 
The basic fact is the learning dynamics fact where the network learns input output modes in a time given by one over the singular value. Then we also find that the singular values of broader hierarchical distinctions of singular vectors associated with broader hierarchical distinctions are larger than those of finer distinctions. And then that means the input out and, and the input output modes correspond exactly to the hierarchical distinctions in the underlying tree. When you put these three facts together, you basically can derive the result that JSON simulations, right? And so this is a, a mathematical plot, a, a plot of mathematical expressions for how the internal representations of a deep linear network evolve in response to data generated from a hierarchical model. And when you plot, plot, put the mathematics next to the simulations of a much more complicated nonlinear network, you see the qualitative um, uh, correspondence, right? So this sort of gives us a conceptual understanding of why we see this hierarchical differential structure, how it's related to the hierarchical structure of data, and how one hidden layer deep learning dynamics is, is driven by this hierarchical structure to generate these progressive waves of differentiation. By the way, I would say that if I'll say that if you didn't have the hidden neural layer, if you just had no hidden layers, which could also learn the data set um, uh, for, for the toy for the for the toy settings, you don't get this hierarchical differentiation of knowledge. Everything gets learned all at once. Uh, it turns out uh, because the, uh, adding a second layer of weights, although it doesn't change the expressivity of the network, it dramatically changes the learning dynamics to yield this hierarchical differentiation of structure. Um, so, Surya, yeah. let me, um, while, you're, while you're paused there, let me uh, get you something from the chat. Um, I think I understand the question. The question, the, the state is, you did this analysis for linear networks, right? but you could also think about different learning algorithms like stochastic gradient descent. And I mean, maybe in this well, context, yeah. it's... Yeah. Yeah. So um, to, to be technically precise, we our mathematical analysis is for batch gradient descent. Um, that is a good description of stochastic gradient descent for large batch sizes and low learning rates. Um, we, we ran, of course, simulations of stochastic gradient descent, and you basically see the same qualitative behavior um, because the uh, um, it, it takes so long to learn these modes that you're effectively averaging over many examples to find the shared structure. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, but we don't have a mathematical theory of the stochastic gradient descent because we haven't modeled the, the noise in SGV. Um, so, so, but, but it, it doesn't, when you simulate it, it doesn't yield any qualitative dis, uh, uh, difference. Great, and then following up your observation that if, if you didn't have a hidden layer, yeah. you wouldn't see any of this, um, how does increasing the number of layers change the picture? Oh, it, it, it's very similar. Yeah. So the the big transition happens between zero hidden layer, zero hidden neuron la layers, and one hidden neuron layer. Um, the uh, things become a little bit sharper. Um, is, I mean, is this simply because the gradient of the cost goes from being linear to nonlinear? Or? Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. And, and what what basically what's happening is there's a cooperative there's a cooperativity effect between the weights of different layers. The weights of different layers need to bootstrap each other up together. So in the same way that you get a hill coefficient, a non-trivial hill coefficient when you have cooperativity and ligand binding, you get a non-trivial hill coefficient in these learning curves here because you have cooperativity across the layers. Yeah, like this, this kind of a thing. There's actually a precise, there's a precise mathematical analogy between cooperativity and ligand binding and this cooperativity in learning uh, across multiple layers. I, I, I'm maybe not precise, but there's a nice analogy there. Um, Great. Okay. Thanks. So, um, okay. So I think that was a good place to pause. Um, okay. So let's go to the the next thing. So, um, so yeah. So far, the conclusions are progressive differentiation hierarchical structure is a general feature of learning in deep neural networks. Deep but not shallow networks exhibit these stage-like transitions during learning. And remarkably, the second order statistics of data was sufficient to drive this hierarchical differentiation. That wasn't obvious to us when we started this project. And I was a bit worried if it would be obvious, if it would work out or not. But it, in hindsight, it, it's, it's clear that it, it had to work out, of course. Um, OK, so there's a bunch of other effects that we look at in, in our PNAS paper that just appeared in, in, in 2019 on this. 
we look at illusory correlations in learning. For example, uh, infants will emphatically say incorrect facts, like worms have bones, despite the fact that they've never seen a worm that has bones. Right? In fact, uh, arguments like this were used to um, rule out associative learning as a, a, a learning mechanism in the brain, because you could never associate worms and bones to learn the fact that worms have bones. It turned out the way to circumvent that logical argument for ruling out associative learning in the brain is as soon as you have a hidden layer that isn't told what to learn, networks will overgeneralize. And, and these networks also do the same thing and they have these illusory effects which we analyze. And um, we also analyzed inductive property judgments and so forth. I'm just, for this talk, I'm just gonna focus on category coherence because I think that's the most fun thing, okay? So let me skip um, induction and generalization and go to category coherence. So what is a category and what makes it coherent, okay? Again, the, you know, the set of all things that are dogs intuitively is very coherent. The set of all things that are, are blue is just intuitively not coherent and we don't have a name for it. Okay, so a very simple proposal is that a category is a subset of objects sharing a subset of features that are important for that category. Okay, I mean, that's not, that doesn't define coherence, but at least it defines what a category might be, right? But this definition immediately suffers from a conceptual Gordian knot that, that many people have been talking about in the field of category learning and psychology, which is, okay, if that's your definition of a category, then how do you learn a category? Well, one thing is you might want to identify the objects that belong to that category, okay? But to identify the objects that belong to that category, you need to know which features are important for that category, right? For example, the notion of fruit, color is not an important um, defining characteristic of fruit. There's other defining characteristics like bear, bear seeds and, and helps you know, plants reproduce and things like that. Uh, and they, they're tasty, you can eat them or most of them, right? So, so, so yeah, so, so there's a question if, if you, if you um, yeah, how do you, how do you identify the objects of a category before you even know which features are important for that category? So conversely, you could try to identify the features that are important for the category. But in order to do that, you already have to have a notion of which objects belong to the category, right? Um, and then again, there's this notion of coherence. Some categories make more sense than others, okay? So can our simple one hidden layer neural network provide uh, some insight into how this uh, Gordian knot can be unraveled, okay? So um, <laughs> here's a picture of my, my son when he was much younger. Um, uh, my lab gave him a, a pink unicorn uh, uh, as a gift. And, and he's kind of looking at it. In Jennifer's language, this is a very novel stimulus, right? Uh, he's definitely staring at it for a long time, all right? Long enough that I could get a stable shot of him, <laughs> which was very difficult around those times, still difficult now. Um, so. Imagine that you're, you're seeing a barrage of objects just over time as an infant, right? Some of them are pink unicorns, some of them are red sofas. And, and so you have a universe of objects that you're seeing and there's a universe of features, uh, color, size, weight, uh, does it move? Um, and so there's a, there's a universe of features and each object has a, either has a feature or it doesn't. So in this table, it's yellow if a particular object has a feature and it's blue if it doesn't, okay? So there's this sort of blooming, buzzing confusion of the world, right, that you're exposed to. And, and this is a toy data set that I created. Um, and uh, you could ask, well, I, I don't have a mathematical theory of my son, but, but the question is, can we develop a mathematical theory of how, how this neural network extracts structure from this, this blooming, buzzing confusion, uh, to use a Turner phrase? Okay, so, um, if you ask how, let's ask how the internal representations of this network evolve when it sees this, this uh, data set, right? Again, it's, it, it's, it, it has an input representation of objects and it's asked to just uh, learn the features for each object every time it's presented. Okay, and if you look at the evolution of internal representations, there's a whole bunch of objects that never get learned. They stay at the origin, right? Then there's a subset of objects that all move out here, a subset of objects that all move out here and a subset of objects that all move out here. Okay. So then I can take the weights of the neural network and extract uh, object analyzers and feature synthesizers. And I can reorder the features according to the, the non-trivial feature synthesizers learned by the network. 
and reorder the objects according to the non-trivial uh, object analyzers learned by the network. And if I just re-permute the indices uh, of this matrix, I find that there are these sort of categories, which are, again, as promised, a subset of objects sharing with higher probability a subset of features. And there's three such categories, okay? They happen to be disjoint in this particular example, but they don't need to be, okay? It turns out the object analyzers exactly pick out these three categories and the feature synthesizers exactly pick out this subset of features, this subset of features, and this subset of features. So the network has simultaneously bootstrapped the learning of objects that belong to a category and the features that are important for that category in ways that we can mathematically describe. Okay. Uh, and, and that relates to the singular value decomposition of this, of this matrix. Um, so, okay, so now you can ask very basic scaling laws for, well, okay, um, how hard is it to pick out one of these categories? Like how many objects do I need and how many covarying features do I need to even detect it in the first place? Second, how long does it take to for me to detect it? Do I learn the larger category earlier than the smaller category? If so, how much faster? Okay, so we can use all the mathematics that we've done so far. We know that the learning of these categories depends on the singular values associated with this, with this data matrix. And we can compute all of that. And we can actually develop a theory, uh, a mathematical theory for it. So here's, so, so here's the rules for generating this data set. Let me tell you that now. There's a total number of objects. There's a total number of features. There are these hidden categories which correspond to a subset of objects of size k sub zero and a subset of features that are important for that category of size k sub f. If an object is in a category and a feature is important for that category, then the probability this object has that feature, the probability this object has that feature is p. Otherwise, the probability of any other object having that feature is some probability q that's less than p. So that's all this noise that's out here that isn't structured, right? And so the question that I posed in the previous slide but now stated mathematically is, for what values of the size of the universe of objects, the size of a, the number of objects in a category, the size of the universe of features and the size of the number of features in a category, and the, the two probabilities, the signal probability P and the noise probability Q, can a category even be learned, okay? So we analyzed this using random matrix theory. We computed uh, when do the singular val vectors of this noisy random matrix correlate with these pristine or platonic singular vectors that would that take uh, ones on all the objects in a category and zeros on all the objects outside of that of that category. And we can compute that overlap and we find that that overlap acquires a non-trivial value as soon as this inequality is met. It actually relates to phase transitions and random matrices, which I won't go into. But, he, but, but the final inequality is very easy to understand. This is, the sing this is a measure of the signal to noise ratio of your category. This is a measure of the size of the category. It only depends on the number of objects and features through their product. And as long as that's greater than the square root of the size of the universe of objects and category, uh, objects and features, then you're good to go. Even a linear neural network can pick it up. Okay. And moreover, we can sh show analytically that the time it takes to learn the category is inversely related to this quantity because this quantity is related to the singular value of, of, of this matrix and, that, and the learning time we already showed is inversely related to singular value. So this is a very simple situation where you can analytically, so you might as well call this quantity category coherence, right? Uh, if you define this quantity to be, to be category coherence, then you have a mathematical theorem that the more coherent a category is, the faster it's learned and there's a threshold of category coherence that even makes it learnable in the first place. And this relates uh, in, a, in a different, much simpler setting uh, to a question that was asked in a much more complex setting in the previous talk, is how does a baby know what is learnable or what is worth learning and what's not? The answer is given by the, the structure of the entire data set. So roughly large subsets of objects that share large subsets of features, at least for the simple learning model, are easily learnable. Um, we can generalize this to a hierarchical setting and, and, and so forth, and it, it all works out. You can find that in, in, the, in the paper. Um, but that, that's our, our, our notion of category and learnability. So let me, um, 
Let me just finish this part of the story um, and, and then I'll take a pause for questions. So this is the last, last part uh, related to this part, which is, um, remember I, I showed you the, the similarity structure of neural representations in human and monkey. And that similarity structure itself was conserved across human and monkey, right? And so now the representation similarity analysis is a method that's widely used in fMRI studies and, and, and now in large scale neuroscience to characterize neural representations, i.e. what is the similarity structure of neural representations? Is there some notion that the similarity structure of neural representations should be conserved across different neural networks, whether in monkeys or humans? Um, it, it doesn't have to be the case that it, it has to be conserved. And we prove a, a mathematical theorem in this paper, again, for, for these deep linear networks, that it does have to be the case, but only under interesting conditions. It's not obligatory, right? So um, here's an example where we trained a neural network to learn some toy data set um, that had hierarchical structure. And uh, if we started it from small initial weights, these are two different initializations that, that both have small initial weights. This is the similarity structure of intro representations that are learned by the neural network. This is the similarity structure of representations measured at the output of the network. Um, and, and it turned out for two different random initializations, the network learned the same thing. However, if you start from large initial weights, they both learn the task, but the similarity structure of intro representations is very, very different, okay? uh, despite the fact that they both learn the task. Right? So it's not an obligatory fact that if you solve a task, you solve it with the same internal representations. But there are some situations where you do. And so we proved a mathematical theorem explaining the simulation result, which is the following. If you solve um, the task with the smallest norm weights, then and only then are your neural similarity representations exactly identical to each other, even if the exact neural activity patterns are not identical to each other. What is the identical pattern of neural similarity that you learn? At least in this some simple setting, it's roughly the square root of the behavioral similarity. Okay. So basically what this is saying is two neural networks that solve the same task optimally were optimal in the sense as precisely defined by smallest norm weights, necessarily learn the same uh, similarity structure of internal representations. So that result is preordained as long as you solve the same task optimally. If you don't solve the same task optimally, you could have different similarity structures for your internal representations. So that's a precise mathematical theorem that holds in this very simple setting. Okay, it's tempting to very irresponsibly generalize. Oh, right, yeah, so theorem, all networks which learn the task with minimum norm weights have the same neural similarity matrix of their internal representations. So from there, it's very tempting to irresponsibly generalize and say perhaps the visual systems of humans and monkeys are solving the same task and they're both solving it very, very well, such that as a result, their similarity structure is the same. Um, and again, that's, I completely acknowledge that that's an irresponsible generalization uh, 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 from, this, from this very simple theorem. That we proved. Okay, so, so, okay, so we've, we've gone through, let's see what time are we at? Um, great. So, We've gone through the first part of the talk. I, I, I had assumed that we probably wouldn't really get to the last part of the talk and we don't have to. Um, so let me pause here uh, for some time and take questions before I move on to a related but different topic. Um, so one question that's already come up in the chat is how, does, how, how do the theorems that you stated hold across different architectures? Across different architectures, yeah, so. I guess the, in a linear world, there aren't too yeah, many. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So we can do those simulate. Okay. So these, sim so any simulation uh, that we do, we can also do in nonlinear networks. And we did them to check whether our results were qualitatively robust to the introduction of nonlinearities. So for example, this thing where you see very similar neural representations, you do get that also in nonlinear neural networks, as long as you start from small initial weights, but you don't get them from large initial weights. Um, so, so that, that holds. And, and, um, what, I mean, the million dollar question in nonlinear networks is 
what statistical structure are they picking up on that goes above and beyond the singular value decomposition of the input output correlation matrix? That's really the million dollar question. We don't have an answer for that in general, of course. I mean, that, that would be a huge question to, to, to crack. We have been doing some work on um, learning in multi-layer rectified linear units. Uh, actually, I don't have the reference of this paper on my slides, but we, it, it's under review at iClear. Um, it's, it's, on, um, the type, it's actually on the archive. It's called Understanding Self-Supervised Learning with Dual Rectified Linear Units. And there, what we're doing is we're looking at a hierarchical generative model and asking, what representations do the hidden units of ReLU networks learn? And we have some results on that, but not a complete uh, uh, theory there. Um, so, so yeah, that's um, good. And there's a question in the chat, which is related also to, to something that, that I was worried about. Um, Tonko's version of the question is, I'm curious how about learning coherent categories in an online fashion. Can you apply the inequality that you stated or some modification of it? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, so, um, Again, uh, learning in infants is pretty slow, right? You need many exposures to many, many objects. So as long as your learning rates are slow, such as you can average over enough examples to detect a singular mode, then it, this applies to on online setting as well, right? So there's some- but, but in um, some way, this means that you're- We, we can't- Your, your, one your threshold is also moving, right? So with time, slowly, but moving in the sense that you your, as you get exposed to more and more objects, and just if I just think about that simple setting where I have features and objects, yeah. Over time, I don't just get more examples. I mean, I don't know how many objects there are in the universe, right? So the number of objects I've seen actually grows. So, is it the number? With if I have a finite sample of data, yeah. I. So basically, like. Um... The, 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 roughly the criteria, okay, so how did we do this simulation, right? Where, where we, we showed this evolution. So what we did is we actually did online, online learning, but with a very slow learning rate, such that the weights didn't change appreciably, right? Until you saw like, you know, a few hundred objects, right? And so that's a significant, that's a significant fraction of the entire universe of objects. So, so the question you're asking is, how does this degrade as you speed up the learning rate? Um, that's a good question. And I think the answer would be- Or, or what if, I mean, or, sorry, are you saying that, that, I mean, if you're in a regime where you only can learn once you've seen a reasonable fraction of all the objects, that would, that might make us nervous about whether you have a theory of real I mean, yeah, I certainly, so I certainly haven't seen. I mean, we, you and I, neither you nor I, have seen all of the possible birds. But I think we're pretty clear on the category. This would refer more to sort of low-level structure that's shared across many objects, right? So, so for example, the larger singular modes, right? They get learned earlier, and those larger singular modes have features that are shared across many, many more objects. So they're shared across a higher density of objects that you're going to encounter, right? So. I, I'm not sure that this explains at all, like what we do when we learn, for example, that a whale is a mammal, right? That's a very singular fact. And then we somehow incorporate that fact into our you know, structure of how we structure animals in our brain. Yeah, we, we can't explain that, right? Um, or we can't explain one-shot learning. Uh, we can't explain any of that stuff. Uh, this is, I think, more related to sort of low-level statistical structure across objects. Um, I don't know if that, that makes sense. Fair. You know, um, once we have like feature detectors for the presence of absence of features, like as we get older, like we see these funny objects that have wings and can fly and can walk and can, uh, you know, and so forth. We, we kind of um, uh, can, can create a category for birds, I guess, but, and, and, and yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't think we have a quantitative theory of learning speed in human over complicated structured domains, if that's what you're asking. We definitely don't have a theory for that. Um, so we have a question from Richard Hamloser. Hi, Richard. Oh, hi, Richard. Uh, 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 an example of the, the benefits of doing this via Zoom. So I, I presume you're, you're far away. 
Uh, if you ask whether you have some intuitive understanding why state-of-the-art networks are so good at understanding and generating language, it, it might be that that's really a question for the next talk, but you could ask whether, yeah. you know, looking, looking ahead. Yeah, so I think, I, so, so the question is, how do we define good, right? So they're, they're pretty amazing at, at, at generating like stuff that looks like language now over the, the scale of paragraphs, right? But many people are now starting to poke at these things and doing adversarial perturbations and so forth. And they make extremely egregious errors under adversarial perturbations or adversarial settings that no human would ever make. So these, these large scale language models have this interesting sort of statistical regularity yet adversarial fragility, right? And so I think, uh, I mean, they're amazing devices. They're really incredible. I'd love to study them more. Um, but, but it's, I think the jury is still out on whether they're sort of uh, uh, the final story of a system that really, really understands language in the same sense that a human does, or they're a stepping stone along that way. Um, would be my take. So I think looking into the adversarial fragilities of these systems would be very, very uh, instructive. And people are. All right. Uh, absent any other questions in the chat, I will remute myself and please okay. go on, Surya. So we'll, um, so, so this th this part of the this part of the thing is, is more about uh, th we're shifting a little bit more to machine learning now, um, and but we're we're dealing with a, a, a property that's of, of incredible importance to to all of us, uh, both in human learning, animal learning, and machine learning is how do neural networks generalize, especially when they have lots and lots of parameters and very few data points, okay? And this, of, of course, has been a huge topic in machine learning recently because of, of that, that famous paper, under, um, Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization. And this work was actually motivated by that, trying to understand that paper. And, and I sort of put it in this talk because it builds on the mathematical machinery that, that we used in the, in the previous talk. So it, it fits in nicely that way in terms of not having to introduce any more machinery. Okay, so, so again, the, the dynamics of learning in deep nonlinear networks is, is quite complex, right? You, you, you have these, the training error can plateau for a while and suddenly go down, plateau, go down and so forth. The test error can go down, but it might rise later on, right? And so this rise of the test error and the drop of the training error is a signature of overfitting. Um, so this non-monotonicity in the test error is overfitting to, train, uh, uh, to the training examples that leads to bad predictions in the new examples. And so we, we'd, of course, love to avoid overfitting. And so there are classical theories of generalization and machine learning that, that roughly uh, boil down to upper bounds on the achievable test error in terms of the training error, plus some measure of the complexity of the family of functions that you're trying to fit, divided by the number of data points that you have, right? So one example of this complexity measure could, for example, be VC dimension. Another example could be Rademacher complexity or, or, or so forth, right? You know, of course, many of the debates in the early learning of language was, do we have enough examples to learn language to begin with, right? So this, this connects to language in that sense is, is given how flexible of a, of a function family can our brain learn, given that we learn language with so few examples, it must not be that flexible, right? And so these theories of generalization error, which bound the test error in terms of the complexity of the learner, have dominated thinking uh, to the point where early practice involved finding the simplest model that could fit the data, uh, you know, as measured by these complexity measures. Roughly for neural networks, these complexity measures boil down to the number of parameters. Um, there are other measures that are based on the norm of the weights as well. But, but what, what they found recently is if you put these bounds if you evaluate these bounds in re the regimes used in practice, where you have tons, you have, we have really, really huge neural networks, um, but you don't have that many data points, the numerator is very, very large, the denominator is very, very small, this bound is bigger than one. So you're upper bounding probabilities by numbers that are bigger than one. So these theories are vacuous. Yet the test error is much less than one, right? It's much less than chance even. So these networks are generalizing very, very well, despite the fact that they're extremely complex. Right? So that's a mystery. Okay, so, so what theoretical ingredients are required to go beyond these classical theories? What's missing? 
Okay, so we took a very different tack. Rather than proving upper bounds on the training and test error, we took the physicist's approach of trying to compute um, asymptotically exact learning curves for both the train error and the test error in the simplest non-trivial toy setting that would reveal insight, hopefully. Okay. So <laughs> we're back to the, 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 the linear network where we can do this. Okay. So we've already studied that. We've already studied the training dynamics. We already know that what the deep linear network builds up is it builds up the singular value decomposition uh, of the training data covariance matrix. Okay, it, it, it learns these singular modes first. Okay, but we haven't talked about the test error, right? In order to talk about test error, we need a mathematical model of the task. And I think one of the biggest impediments in developing a theory of deep learning that's relevant to practice is we don't have a mathematical model of the tasks that we're asking deep networks to solve, i.e. we don't have a mathematical function that tells us what a cat is from the pixels, right? We don't have a mathematical model of ImageNet and so forth. So I think something we need to do is really develop mathematical models of the task. Um, uh, this is also in line with, with a lot of Bill's, uh, Bill Bialik's work where you know, he showed very nicely that in many situations, you need a mathematical model of the statistics of natural signals that neural networks are exposed to in order to understand why neural networks what they do what they do, right? We need that kind of same thinking in machine learning, I think. Um, by the way, th this could be generalized to deeper linear networks, and I won't bother you with those, those details. But OK, so, so, so before we go into generalization, let me give you an alternate perspective on the learning dynamics. So up until now, we've been discussing the singular value of the neural network as a function of training time and a function of the truth of the singular value in the training data, which I'm going to call s hat. And what we showed is that as the, sing the training data singular value gets larger, this is what the learning curves look like for the neural network singular values. They rise up in time. But alternatively, I could ask at a given time, what aspects of the data have been learned? So I can ask, what is the fraction of the singular value that's gotten learned you know, as, a fraction of, as a fraction of the total singular value that will eventually get learned? at a given time, okay? So now I'm plotting the strength of structure in the data on the horizontal axis and the fraction of that structure that's been learned uh, as, as, time of, uh, as time evolves, right? So at early times, uh, only the very large singular values have been learned. The small ones have not been learned. At later times, there's a transition where singular values above a certain threshold have been learned, and at later times, singular values below a threshold have not been learned. Okay? So you can view the process of learning in these neural networks in a very visceral way as a singular mode detection wave that sweeps in from large data singular values into small data singular values as time evolves. Okay? And, and, and okay, so, so basically just all I wanted you to, 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 to take into account was, was this, this visualization of the learning dynamics. Okay. Okay. Now back to the, the issue of generalization, right? In, in order to, to address generalization, I need a mathematical model of, of the data. So we're going to follow something called the student teacher scenario, where we model the data as coming from a teacher neural network that has ground truth, uh, that has ground truth, um, uh, that has ground truth um, synaptic weights. Okay. And there's a student network that's learning. Okay. Uh, the data depends on the synaptic weights of the teacher only through the product because the teacher is linear, right? By the way, I, I will show you simulations later on of what changes when you look at nonlinear networks and we'll see the qualitative theory uh, sort of holds there. Okay, but anyways, the teacher is linear. This is the product of weights. The way we generate the training data is we have a random set of inputs that are coming in that are whitened, okay? They feed forward and through the teacher and generate outputs but those outputs are corrupted by noise, okay? So then the training data is handed off to the student, okay? And the, the input and, and the training data drives learning the student, okay? So we've already talked about how the, the training data matrix drives learning in the student. So the new ingredient here is how is the, the teacher neural network buried in the training data? And it turns out it's buried in the following fashion. 
the, 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 the input output correlation matrix of the training data equals the ground truth weight matrix of the teacher corrupted by uh, this, this noise matrix, okay? We're going to assume that the teacher is a low rank teacher. So it's in that sense, it's a very simple teacher neural network. Um, we're gonna operate in the limit where the number of outputs and number of inputs are large and the student is full rank. So the student has many more parameters than are required to explain the teacher. Um, and, and, and so that's the setting that we're, we're looking at. Okay, so, um, okay, so basically to understand generalization, we now need to understand the relationship. So, so the, the, the best student network is a student network that computes the singular value decomposition of W bar, right? Because that's, that's the teacher. But the student has, doesn't have access to, to W bar. It only has access to a corrupted version of W bar. So here we're facing a low rank matrix perturbed by a noise matrix, okay? So this is another interesting random matrix theory problem, perturbation of low rank matrices by high dimensional noise random matrices, okay? So let me review the results from that. These are results from a couple of random matrix theorists uh, here. So, so here we have the pristine teacher uh, neural network with its singular value decomposition. And we're here, we have the training data covariance matrix with its singular value decomposition. A natural question is, how do the noise corrupted singular vectors in the training data relate to the pristine singular vectors of the teacher neural network? Okay. The answer to this question depends on the strength of the signal in the teacher, right? Let's assume just for normalization purposes that this noise has covariance order one. So the signal to noise ratio in the problem is given by the strength of the singular values of the teacher. Okay, this, on this axis, I'm plotting the overlap between the corrupted singular vector and the true singular vector as a function of the signal to noise ratio. And you can see that there's a phase transition here where if the signal is too small, the overlap is zero. But as the signal reaches a certain threshold, and increases beyond that, the overlap rises. Okay, in physics language, this is known as the BPP phase transition, but, but in any case, so there's a phase transition between zero overlap where the noise corrupted singular vector is perpendicular to the true singular vector, and then a transition where there's some knowledge, the training data contains some knowledge about the teacher. So um, there's a, now, now this, this matrix is low rank, but this matrix is high rank. So there's a whole bunch of noise singular values as well. Uh, so here's an example of the singular value spectrum of the training data. When you have a, a, a rank three teacher and the, and the signal is large. So you have three outlier singular values and the singular vectors of this know something about the teacher. And then here's a bunch of noise. So now, now imagine the learning process where you think about that singular mode detection wave penetrating from right to left as learning evolves. It'll pick up some information about the singular value. The training error and the test error will drop. It'll pick up some more information about these, both training and test error will drop. But then as the wave penetrates this, oops, sorry. As, uh, when this wave penetrates this noise, um, the training error will drop because you learn about the training error, but the test error will rise because irrelevant information in the training error doesn't seep into the into into the neural sorry irrelevant information about the training data seeps into the neural network. Um, okay, so okay, so now here's an example of a match between theory and experiment. This is for a rank one teacher. Okay, so here you see a sudden drop in the training error, uh, and then a slow drop in the training error after that. You see at the same time that you have a sudden drop in the training error, you have a sudden drop in the test error then a slow rise in the test error, okay? Um, so what's happening is, uh, and as the signal to noise ratio increases, learning becomes easier and, and better, right? So, so what's happening is imagine that you only have one outlier singular value. When the singular mode detection wave penetrates the one outlier, you get this drop here and this drop here. And then when it penetrates the Mar this marsenko pester C of noise, the training error drops and the test error rises, okay? There's this interesting optimal early stopping time, right? 
we can compute analytically the, tr the test error at the optimal early stopping time, and we can ask, what does it depend on? Okay. It depends on the following quantities. It depends on the signal to noise ratio in the data. It depends on the scale of the initialization of the weights of the teacher, of, 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 sorry, of the student network. But it doesn't depend on the number of parameters in the student network. So it doesn't depend on the VC dimension of the student network at all, right? Or, or any of those complexity measures. Okay, so, so, but what you do need to do is you do need to start it from small weights in order to have a, a small uh, test error that doesn't depend on the size of the network, okay? So basically the, op, the test error at the optimal early stopping time depends on the structure of the data and the initialization of the student, but not on the student architecture. Um, this is an example of a rank N student, a rank one teacher, but five hidden layers. And there's a nice match between theory and experiment there. Okay, this is an example of, um, uh, we, we just keep everything else the same, but we just change every linear neuron to a leaky or ReLU neuron. So now these are simulations of nonlinear networks. And you can see the same qualitative structure holds, sudden drop in both initially a drop in the training, but a rise in the test at later times. So this qualitative structure is robust to in the introduction of nonlinearities. Right? And so, so hopefully this gives you a, a conceptual understanding of what's going on. There was another really interesting result uh, uh, in, this, in this paper, and this will be my, this can be my last slide, um, or I think second to last slide, but um, in this paper that motivated this work, there was a really interesting uh, observation, which is, you know, what, like what happens? So, so here in this paper, what they studied was they, they just randomized the output labels in, in some real world data set. <laughs> My son is crawling across the floor, trying to extract some toys from his, uh, his bedroom. <laughs> Anyways, um, so uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, if you, so what they showed is that deep neural networks can memorize completely random noise of the same data set size as structured data, okay? So that was, that was sort of really interesting because they can memorize the noise. But what they found is if, if, if you randomize data so that you make, it very, you make it essentially unstructured noise, it still learns it, but it takes longer to learn, right? So for example, here's a learning curve when you learn uh, the true labels in the data and the learning curve is very rapid, it drops very quickly, okay? If you, if you just randomize the labels, you still learn, you get to zero training error, but it takes longer to learn, okay? Not by very much, it's, it's maybe a factor of two or something like that, but that's what happens. Okay, and this also relates to questions that were asked in the previous talk, um, you know, about the, you know, about the speed of learning, can you learn noise, can you not, not learn noise, and so forth. So, um, yeah, so can we explain this? So, so that can be easily explained as well. Uh, so we did, so, so if you have structured data where there's a relationship between the output and the input, then you have some structure here, right? And because you have this structure here, the learning is fast as so a singular mode detection wave penetrates uh, the C, sorry, sorry, penetrates these outlier singular modes. But if you control the output covariance and the input out covariance to be the exact same as that of your data, but you randomize it so that there's no correlation between input and output, you expand the marsenko pester C a little bit and you destroy the outlier singular modes. So learning can only be detected when the singular mode detection wave at a later time penetrates the marsenko pester C and the training error will drop. And so we, we reproduce this observation, unfortunately with the colors flipped uh, in the deep linear network. Okay. All right. So here's the, the basic picture. In machine learning, uh, we're always optimizing on the wrong landscape, right? We're always optimizing on the training error landscape, uh, but the test error is a different landscape. And so achieving a minimum of the training error can actually yield a hit on the test error. Um, so various methods of preventing that can help with overfitting. A uh, case in point here, optimal early stopping really helps. Uh, by the way, we can also reproduce this double descent phenomenon in, in this simple setting, and we show that it goes away if you do the optimal thing, uh, the optimal early stopping. Um, okay, so now just let me uh, summarize this part of the, of the talk in a way that I think 
will qualitatively generalize to the nonlinear settings. And, and, and the ingredients that we'll need to develop a theory of generalization uh, in general, right? So just to summarize, we analytically computed the training and test error as a function of training time in deep linear networks. The results qualitatively reflect the, the, the learning in the same networks, but with linear change to ReLU. Um, the generalization error as a function of training time depends in a sensitive but completely computable way on the initial student weight strength, the teacher rank, the teacher SNR. But the generalization error at, as the, at the optimal early stopping time does not depend on the student network size for small and weight initializations, as long as it's expressive enough, right? The reason for that is, is that these neural networks learn the most important structure in data first, and then they only learn the less important structure later. So the learning, the entire learning trajectory matters. Um, this also explains why learning scramble data takes longer time than learning structured data. And it also suggests that any attempt to bound generalization error solely in terms of the student network architecture or capacity alone is unlikely to yield a loose bound. The structure of the data really matters in understanding why we can generalize. So given that both the trajectory, learning trajectory matters and the structure of the data, which ultimately drives learning trajectory matters, to understand generalization, we definitely need a theory of the structure of data and its impact on learning dynamics. And it's likely that the generalization success that we see in practice may originate through some kind of conspiracy between the structure of data we ask our neural networks to learn and the implicit learning dynamics or biases in learning dynamics that these networks have. So fundamentally, understanding generalization in the language of physics becomes a non-equilibrium problem. We, 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 yeah, I, I don't think we, we, can, we can really understand it without an understanding of the full non-equilibrium dynamics of learning. Okay, um, let me summarize. So, so we've done a lot of theory in nonlinear networks as well, in particular, how to initialize nonlinear networks so that they're dynamically critical. And that actually enabled a follow-up work to train 10,000 layer convolutional neural networks without using any kind of stuff like batch norm and things like that. So I, I was gonna uh, talk about that, so, but I, I think it's best not to even enter that world and just leave time for questions. Uh oh, am I still? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. I thought for a second I wasn't on the, the Zoom call. Right, that's right. Yeah, you, you get silence. You don't know. Maybe, maybe you've been disconnected all this time. Um, thank you. That was great. Uh, we do have some time for questions. First one has shown up. I, so you don't see the chat, so I should read for you. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> 